The first thing we need to remember when we are confronted with situations in our families, we need to remember that all of us find things in ourselves that we have not chosen. When we are in Christ, we can actually deal with the things which we find in us, not allow them to take us over. But things that we find in us, when they become too pressing and too difficult to overcome, then we need to ask the question, why is this temptation not leaving me, even though I don't want it, even though I confess it, even though I command it to leave me? Can it be that it has some legal right? Bring it before the Lord. Lord, how can I remove the legal right of this particular temptation? How can I be free from this temptation? And, and the same as I do for myself, I actually can do on behalf of my family members as a priest. Mm -hmm. Lord, I see in my child, in my grandchild, this particular tendency, this particular behavior. And actually, I recognize this to be running in the family, if I do. Lord, I bring before you my bloodline. I bring before you the generations that went before me. And I want to come to you as a priest on behalf of myself and on behalf of my family, on behalf of my bloodline. Lord, I want to confess that there is a sin that developed into a stronghold of iniquity that seems to be manifesting down the generations. Would you please, Lord, forgive this sin and eradicate it, uproot it, let the land be healed so that everybody who lives in this land may be blessed. Mm -hmm. And to, the way I've pictured it is we have a family plot that we inherited and we all share it. All our houses are in this family plot. And so everybody feeds off the land. The problem is that this land has snakes and scorpions and rats and cockroaches and whatever sources of pollution of the underground water which we need to drink. Mm -hmm. So if any of us does work that changes the field, that changes the land, mm -hmm. everybody else who lives in the land gets blessed. Mm -hmm. Does this picture make sense to you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because everybody lives on the same land. Mm -hmm. Okay, different houses. But we all eat of the same trees. We all eat of the same crops. We mm -hmm. all drink of the same water, even though it comes to different faucets in different houses. Mm -hmm. But the underwater, the, uh, it, it's the same and it's polluted and we all drink of the same. So any of us that will go out and do the work, everybody will be blessed. Mm -hmm. And that's the role of the priesthood. And in fact, this is why I had felt that for today, the little teaching that I thought we should do, now I see there is a relevance attached to it. Let me share with you the screen. I had in mind to talk to you about Epaphras. And um, there are three mentions of Epaphras in the scriptures. I'll start with the third in Philemon 123. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ, greets you. Fellow prisoner. And the way I understand it, whether it was literal, whether they were actually in physical prison or not, the way I understand it primarily is that they had been taken captive by Jesus in the good sense. Mm -hmm. The Lord has taken our lives captive. We are bond servants. Okay, so maybe here they were also talking about being in prison together in the same prison. But I believe it also means that we have been taken captive by the love of God to serve him. Now, here is why this is important. Let's find out what Epaphras does for God and for the body of Christ. In Colossians 1 7, it says, As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow, fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. 
Okay, so the question is, what does that mean practically? The answer is in 412. Epaphras, who is one of you, a bond servant of Christ, greets you, and here is the key, <coughs> always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear witness, I bear him witness, that he has a great zeal for you and for others in other places, doesn't matter. So, who is Epaphras? A man of prayer, a priest of God. What does he do? He labors fervently. And you do realize the word labor has to do with manual work. Yes. Of course, in this case, he does not dig literally, but we can think of it as doing groundwork. Mm. And think of the word groundwork in different perspectives. Mm. And one of the important groundworks that need to be done is for the healing of the land. Mm. And when the land gets healed, everybody who lives on that land gets blessed. And so this is one of the ways to approach intercessory prayer as we know it. I personally would call it, if I had not learned by others that people use the term intercessory prayer, the terminology that I would have selected would be priestly prayers. And why would I say priestly prayers? Because that's what the priests are called to do, to pray on behalf of others. At this point, it is good to remember what is the primary, I would call it, identity of Jesus. For me, this is a primary identity. And let's remember it. I'm sure you know it in Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, mm -hmm. let me increase the size of the font, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So this is the dual nature of Jesus, or maybe the two sides of the same coin that give the coin the value. We have the same duality in the image of the lamb and the lion, mm. or if I want to follow the sequence apostle and high priest, I would say the lion and the lamb. Mm. And um, in other parts, especially of the book of Hebrews, he is called a priest forever. Uh, let me go to Hebrews chapter 5, mm. and let me read, for every high priest taken from among men, is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. This is the identity of Christ, as we will read on to understand with more clarity, but I believe we are called to be like Jesus in all things. Yes. I believe we all need to grow up to some degree, and according to the goodwill of God for each and every one of us, and according to the calling of God for each and every one of us, but each one of us must have that little bit of lion in us and that little bit of lamb in us, or maybe actually a lot of the lamb in us. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I think we all need to be priests of God. Mm -hmm. And I believe that all of us are called or let me use the terminology that we are reading here. I believe we have all in Christ been called, we have all in Christ been taken from among men and have been appointed for men, for human beings, in things pertaining to God that we may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And I would add here, within the sphere of responsibility and therefore authority that God has apportioned to each one of us. Mm. 
what is an absolutely certain sphere of responsibility and authority that we have been given? Our families. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have been taken from among men. We are the Christians. We are the royal priesthood. We are the believers in Christ. We have been taken from among the human race, and we are a different race. We are a different nation. We are a peculiar people. We are a royal priesthood. What for? We have been taken from among the human beings to be the lights in the world, as we have been called to reflect the light of Jesus, to be praying for God's will to be done, for his kingdom to come, to be praying for his name to be hallowed here in the earth, in our midst today. We are the channels of his glory coming to the earth. That happens through prayer. It is sin that separates us from God. And when a priest stands and prays, what happens? The sin loses its power. When we bless, the light prevails over the darkness. When we ask the Lord to forgive, forgiveness is extended. Need I remind ourselves the first statement that Jesus said after his resurrection and after he said, receive the Holy Spirit. The first statement was this. To whomever you forgive their sins, the sins will be forgiven. To whomever you retain the sins, the sins shall be retained. This is power. This is authority. This is responsibility. And it is from the Lord to us, his people, in the royal priesthood of Jesus Christ. As a general principle, every Christian, every born-again believer is called to that. As a general principle, no child can be given the authority for which the child is growing up to become ready to receive. So we, we cannot be spiritual children. Just spiritual regeneration is not enough. Spiritual regeneration is a, begins the process of preparation for us to come to the point, to come to the moment when we can be given the authority that Jesus gave to mm -hmm. his, I will say, royal priesthood. So when we have grown up in Christ, when we have stepped into the realm of authority and responsibility for which we were purchased by the precious blood of Jesus, then eventually our job is to do exactly what it says in Hebrews 5.1. We have been appointed in things pertaining to God. And what happens when we offer gifts and sacrifices for sins? We remove the authority of sin. God can intervene. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's read on. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Mm. Have you noticed how, other than being spiritually born again in Christ, mm. another major shift, like the first major shift is we are in the world, then we come into Christ. And that's an amazing thing. But have you noticed that there is another amazing shift that happens slowly and is never complete with everybody, but becomes complete with some? Is the shift from being carnally minded and selfish and not caring for others to a place where we have compassion, where we truly love, when we can genuinely forgive our enemies and bless our enemies, when we can pray for those who hate us and show it to us, and yet we pay no attention because we know they're ignorant and going astray. Mm -hmm. And the darkness that is in them cannot hurt us. We just realize we need to pray for them. Yeah. Because of this, 
he is required, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins. I hope you realize that what used to be physical sacrifices for them in the Old Testament, for us in the New Testament, can be summarized to prayers requesting forgiveness, to confession of sin on behalf of ourselves and on behalf of others. When we confess sins on behalf of others, what we practically do is intercession in the literal biblical sense of the word endefxi, translated intercession. Intercession is not just prayers. Prayer is another thing. Intercession is another thing. Petition is another thing. Supplication is another thing. Thanksgiving is another thing. All of them exist in the Bible as different separate words and concepts, each one of them being a spiritual tool. So confession of sin is a sacrifice. It's a priestly sacrifice. What does it do? It causes God to overlook sin so that he will not have to pour out his wrath because of the sin. Mm -hmm. So I sought for a, man, for a man among them who will build the bridge and stand in the gap on behalf of the land that I might not have to destroy it, but I didn't find any. So I poured out my wrath. Well, that's what the prophet of God, I think it was Ezekiel, that's what he said to explain the coming of Jesus Christ. But now Jesus Christ has been multiplied by many, many brethren who are like Jesus, having of the same spirit as Jesus, doing the same job as Jesus did, being his priesthood when he is our high priest. Does that make any sense? Yes. yes. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. This may be speaking specifically for the role of the high priest, but can you also see how the same principle is true for all of us? Yeah. Yeah. So Christ also did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. I want to tell you something about this word forever which in Greek is iston eona, which in English would translate the word century. Mm -hmm. But century literally means um, 100 years, but that's not what it means here. Especially it is singular. But there isn't just one eona, there isn't just one century. I mean, every 100 years we have a new century. So what does it mean? All the translations agree that the translation is the word forever. Mm. Holman, forever, young. Ah, here it says to the age. Yeah, uh, young always tries to be literal. Anyway, mm. the point is this. This word forever, a priest forever, means before he was born in the earth as a human being, he was mm -hmm. a priest. Mm -hmm. When he left the earth and went back into heaven, he stepped back into his heavenly, timeless, ever-present status and reality, which was, is, and will be because the age, that statement, is symbolic of the timeless spiritual realm, which is like a, a line, a never-ending line, or maybe a layer, a level, has no beginning and edge. It's just a state of things. Mm -hmm. But underneath it, the earth is rotating around the sun, and time shapes everything in which life happens. So we live in a time-restricted space, and a space-restricted time. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yesterday, today, or tomorrow, whatever time 
in the time and space restricted life, there is the everlasting, ever present now age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. So he was, he is, he will be, but at any time he steps into our time and space restricted realm. That's his eternal identity. What what does that say for us? It says that's our heavenly identity. Mm. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. Because in this space, which is not a space, but we don't have another word for it, in this heaven, in this realm, we are already seated with Jesus. Right? Mm. Mm. So if we are seated in heavenly places together with Jesus, we are outside of our time and space, space and time restricted environment. Our spirits, which are spirits of righteous men becoming perfected. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. But our spirits are seated together with Jesus in heavenly places. So our eternal, our heavenly our ageless identity is we together with him are priests forever in the order of Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And when we live our lives in this time and space restricted environment, at some point we are born, at some point we are born again, then there is a process, a long time of perfecting so that that for which we were born, we can also become. And when we are found approved to become, then the authority and respective responsibilities are given to us. And Epaphras is one of those unique examples in the scriptures who knew that his job in life was to labor fervently in prayers on behalf of others, Mm -hmm. which is the nature of Jesus to begin with. It is thanks to Jesus that salvation came to mankind. It is thanks to Jesus that salvation remains available. It is thanks to Jesus that salvation shall become the reality in the day of wrath when we shall be spared and we shall be saved from the wrath of God. In the meantime, we have a work to do to work the land Mm. and turn it from a cursed land to a blessed land. Mm. What brings the curse? The sin. What removes the power of sin? Our prayers. What prayers? Our intercessions specifically and our supplications, our petitions before God. Not literally the thanksgiving that has its own role. Mm. Not literally the worship, it has its own role. Not literally the declarations and the proclamations and the glorification of God and the hallowing of his name, all those things have their purpose, but they do not remove the power of sin. What removes the power of sin? Our intercession. Lord, I come to you on behalf of myself and on behalf of the people for which you called me and appointed me. And I confess the sin of the land so that you may actually forgive the land and bless the land rather than pour out your wrath upon it because of the sin that is in it. Verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, obviously you realize the days that he was in the earth in an earthly form, living as a man among them, among us, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with them and cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Prayers and supplications with them and cries and tears, and we're talking about God incarnated. Mm-hmm. Well, Was he being theatrical? Was he playing a role? Or was he really pouring out his heart before God? Mm 
-hmm. on behalf of people. Is that compassion? Is that suffering along with those who suffer? Is that what we are called to? Is that how we can change the lives of our family, the lives of the people around us? Jesus changed the lives of many by doing that. And it's interesting that even though Jesus himself was born to be a son of God, even my statement is wrong. He was born son of God, not to be. He was born son of God. He was sinless by birth. And yet he had to learn obedience through suffering. Wow. Mm. And verse 9 says that he also had to be perfected, but he was sinless. Mm. He was perfect by birth. He was born to be perfect. And yet, we are looking at a word that seems to be associated by being obedience in suffering, not for himself, but on behalf of others. Yeah. And having been perfected, he became the author. But I thought he was born to be the author. That's what he was born for. He became a man to begin with, to be the author of eternal salvation. And yet the reality is that he had to be perfected into it. Mm. Called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. And even the Greek here, let me not go into this difficult word, but um, maybe... One way to say it, this word, which is difficult, I, I mean, I can tell you it says prosagorephthis, but to explain it, I'll need 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So so the word called, actually, what's net? Designated. Wow, that's a nice one. Designated by God. Declared by God. Addressed by God. Ah, you see, that's why I would need 10 minutes to explain it. Mm -hmm. All of these words are important. Called, designated, appointed, addressed by God. You need all of them to explain that word. And it's amazing. We're looking at four translations and we find four different translations for it. It's because it's not an easy word. But the point I wanted to make here is this. This actually called by God can be wrong in the sense that someone can think that he that was his calling from before he was born. Mm -hmm. But actually this word and the other translations point to the fact that eventually he was designated after he became perfected mm -hmm. and after he became the author of eternal or through becoming the author of eternal salvation, by being perfected, through the things which he suffered, by learning obedience, eventually God designated him and declared him, now you are the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, which means what for us? It means that we can all expect to go through a similar process of learning by practicing, thus becoming obedient, thus growing up to be that which we were born to be so that we can come to the place that God will designate us for us to be his priests on earth and address us as priests for which we were born, but we need to also be authorized for it so that through us, the things for which we have been appointed by God on behalf of men, we can actually practice them. Yeah. Yeah. For what purpose? For God's will to be done, for his kingdom to come, for his name to be hallowed, for the land to be healed, for the light to shine in the darkness, for the power of sin to be defeated, for people to change and see the light and come to Christ. Mm -hmm. 